So, hmm. so this is a good. What's the make of it? It's Pilot, Japanese. Oh, pilot, yeah. But I mean, it's really cheap. So you can buy 10 of them if you want. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about the new movie. Yep. Uh, how, did the, how did you come to the project? What was the context? What, what was going on when you approached it? Actually, you have a really nice pen. I like it because I don't have to put a lot of pressure when I... This is actually one of my absolute favorites. Yeah? Well, okay, sorry, I thought it was a lead pen. No, okay. It's well, the it's, it's one, a yeah. Caron Dash. Yeah, it's really nice, Thank actually. You. Well, I don't really know how I started making the film. I just make the things I make, and I don't really know where it starts. It starts somewhere and turns into something. Mm. So I don't really know how it's. It, it seemed like you took a little bit of a break between your, your previous feature and this one. Well, not a break, really, but I do different things. You had two books in that time? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I'm going to continue to make different things. Mm. I'm not just doing films and then, so, I, had no, I have no career plan, no goals, really, except to stay in Sweden, because I love Sweden. That's the only goal I have, really. Mm. Are you going to return to poetry at any point? Um, always. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I was. I don't think the, the previous two books have been translated yet. But is there plans for that? No, I don't think no. so. That's a shame. Yeah. Well, it'll happen when I die or something. <laughs> well, that's fine with me. We'll see. How How is the production of this film? It seems like it it has a lighter touch maybe than than Mammoth. I can imagine that the productions were probably also very different. Very different. Yes. This was a really nice. The whole shooting this film was really nice. It was just a lot of fun. And I think actually that's, to try to answer your first question, is probably that I wanted to make something, that was probably one of the reasons why I wanted to make the film, was I wanted to make something that the, the project itself, the process would be fun mm. and sort of simple or something and smaller. And it was actually, it was a little good time. We had a lot of fun making it, and we had a really good team, and everyone was, I think, enjoying themselves. Mm. Do you have a personal relationship to the subject matter? Yes, of course. So, what was your upbringing like? How, how did you come to punk music? Well, I grew up, I, I'm the same age as the girls in the film, so I was also, I was 13 years old in 1982, and I was, uh, I've always been very interested in music, even from when I was five or something. Mm, my mother married uh, or met a new man who listened a lot to music, so I sort of, I, I really, I was really into music when I was five, yeah. and then it just progressed into. And then, and then punk came. But we were a little bit late for just like the girls in the film. We were a little bit too late because the punk thing happened really, it sort of like died out in 82 or 81 or 80 yeah. or something and I, so it, it felt a little bit like you were sort of late for something. Mm. But still I think it was an important thing for me and I think it, I, in many ways I'm still there in that place where I live, just some details changed but you stay very much the same yeah. in many ways. And I think I've, there was some feeling that you could do anything. And I think I still have that feeling. And I think I have still have the feeling that you don't necessarily have to do things very well. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to do them. <laughs> and you just sort of have to keep working and trying different things. And the result is not necessarily the most important thing. The most important thing is just to sort of let things out of yourself and yeah. bang the drums really hard. <laughs> And it was uh, an adaptation of your wife's graphic novel. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you approach the, the uh, adaptation process of taking a graphic novel and turning it into a film? It was really simple. And, uh, I, I just asked her if, she, if it was OK with her. And then she said it was fine. And then I just turned it into, I, I, I changed quite a lot, especially in the story. But I sort of tried to stay very close to the atmosphere and the tone mm. of, the, of, of the book. 
and especially since the book is about uh, Coco's childhood, so it's sort of eighty percent autobiographical. So that was, of course, also because I didn't know her in those days. We grew up in different cities, and we, and we, we met much later. So that was really fun to sort of fantasize about what she was like when she was thirteen years old or twelve, mm. something. Um, so I think I wrote the script quite fast, and I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's wrong, but it feels like everything went just really smooth and fast, and everything. It's probably wrong, you know. Memory tricks. <laughs> I don't know. There, you mentioned the tone, which is I think pretty palpable in the in the film. Yeah. And I'm wondering how you delivered that tone stylistically. And actually, when I when I I just realized that actually the book is actually a little bit sadder. Mm. It's more about sort of like being alone and sort of your mother is away at, at the party and you're sort of. <laughs> But I still feel like we, I sort of captured the tone of the friendship and things like mm -hmm. that. And then I maybe I added a little bit lighter touch, or not, not lighter, but sort of more of hope and happiness or something. Mm -hmm. Because I just felt like that what was needed in the world today is not more sadness, but more happiness, actually. And I also just felt that there were some things that happened in so in my life or around me that where I felt that I, c I cannot really I was in sad things and then I just felt that I had to sort of balance that with some good things. Mm. Yeah, the optimism of it is, is not usually associated with punk uh, stories from that time. I was thinking, it reminded me of seeing this Swedish film from I think 1980 called Children's Island. Um, okay, yeah, 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 well that's a nice film. But it's very, it's much darker, like... Yeah, yeah, but it's, yeah. Well, I watched that film, actually, when we, we talked about that film when we were doing this one. Uh, in many different ways, because I think that, especially since I'm, I'm a little bit nationalistic, so I think that Sweden has a very, I am sort of feel that I'm part of a very strong tradition in Sweden, where we sort of make films and TV series, and things about children and mm. also for children, which is, so we, I watched a lot of things like that movie, mm. for example. But yeah, it's, that, that, that movie's darker, but uh, I want to do things, my ideal at the moment, I'm changing the whole time, but my ideal at the moment is to make something that really takes things really seriously, but treats it with some kind of optimism, which is not the same thing as positive. You don't have to talk about it in a positive way. You can say that everything is terrible, mm. but it will get better. Mm. I thought that's sort of some kind of ideal for me at the moment. Tomorrow I will have another idea <laughs> today. Uh, could you speak maybe to the, the context of the suburban spaces and the urban spaces? It's a part of the storyline, mm -hmm. but maybe a little more, shed a little more light on what that means in a Swedish context. Yeah. I think there is, is, is yeah, I, we can talk about it, but it's also, it's, there are some things that are sort of, will not be understood outside of Sweden because they're sort of like, it's difficult to relate to the music because there's a lot of Swedish music with Swedish lyrics and everything, and there's a lot of talk about Swe places in Sweden that if you don't know them, you will not really understand, but there is, a, the, the, one of the things that happen in the film is that they, they grow up in sort of a, in, in, in the center of Stockholm. Mm. And they, at one point, they meet some boys who are living in a sort of a suburban area. And I think also that reflects a lot of sort of how the punk movement in Sweden was divided into many different categories. One was very political, and one was had very sort of strong roots in the sort of 60s and 70s political movement. Mm. And some of it was really more about partying and sort of. Uh, starting a fire, so I don't know. <laughs> um, so I think they're sort of like two different, they meet some boys or more into sort of punk as a kind of fashion thing maybe, mm. or maybe not, I'm not sure. I don't want to judge them, but they're sort of a little bit different. But Sabotage is an actual band and, and two of the members were the also actors in the, yes. in the film? Yeah, yeah. W yeah. Where, where did they fit in? Were they more of like a political or? Well, in a way, yes, yeah. Well, 
Well, this is really difficult to explain in English <laughs> because there are so many nuances that I, I can't really explain all of this. But um, but that was really one of the greatest things to have to have them because I think they were really wonderful actors, and that was sort of like there is there are a lot of you know, stories in the film that are small things, small details. Because I'm all, mostly interested in details, I'm very I'm not really interested in the whole big story, but. There are a lot of details that sort of amuse me a lot, and one of them is that the old punk rockers who were 12 years old now they are sort of 40 and old. And, <laughs> yeah. Your films usually have they they sympathize or even take the perspective of the the child, and the adults are usually portrayed in a more negative way. But in this film, it's kind of just slightly critical in a humorous way. Yeah. I was wondering how that fits into your interest in that, that theme in your films. I think that's a question more for the audience. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't, but I think I, I always try not to judge people in my movies. I always try to like all the characters. I don't always succeed with that, but that's my goal. Mm. I always try to, and that's one of the problems I have with cinema in general is that there is this tendency to sort of look at people in a cold light mm. and I don't think that's very productive mm. and um, so even people who do stupid things like forget about their children they are still nice people mm. there's also this in your films a yearning to go someplace else or find mm -hmm. an ideal place and in here I mean, we kind of talked about the suburban-urban dichotomy, which is kind of at the end of the film as well. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also punk as maybe like an abstract space or something, like place to go, an idealized mm -hmm. place. And I'm curious about your thoughts on that subject as well as maybe how it relates to Christianity as another kind of belief structure that is introduced in the film. I don't know, really. This is also thing, something that the, or the audience should have opinions about, not really me. Mm. But I think it's true that you know the, the children, the kids in the movie, they want to really to find a new place, and that place is playing music. But I don't think very. I, I don't. I mean, this is a movie where I don't really feel that I've. I've, I've I think I feel that I've worked much more intuitively than mm. in the, in, theoretically. So I haven't really. I don't think this is a movie that. Well, you can, I mean, you can search for it and other people can search for it, but I don't really search for sort of the big, deep, hidden meanings. Mm. I think it's more of a film about, for me, I think more in terms of energy and euphoria and happiness and how to survive. Mm. Was there a degree of kind of improvisation uh, in the production, either in the acting yes. and also with the filming? It seems like the mm -hmm. camera is very fluid. It, there's mm -hmm. a little zooming in and mm -hmm. yeah, that's my favorite thing to do. I I, I want to sort of be, to be surprised myself. Mm. I don't really respect the writer when I'm directing, <laughs> so I don't really respect you know things I've written. I don't really read the script, mm. partly because I need reading glasses and I can't really take mm. them on and off the whole time <laughs> because that's just annoying. So I work really closely with an assistant director and she reads the script, <laughs> I don't. Mm. Uh, so, but I, I'm really happy that those days when I go home and it didn't really turn into what I expected it to turn into, but it turned into something else. Mm. So when the actors, well, they don't all, well, sometimes it really, it's, it stays close to the script, but when they really go crazy and do some other things, then, then that's wonderful. Mm. And I think that's a, also has to, something to do with mm, I think this is all, also has something to do actually with sort of like looking at things with warm or cold warmth or sort of it's, it's about your eyes if you look at things with warm eyes or cold eyes and if you look at things in, with cold eyes you want to control your characters, you want to control the actors because of, you want to sort of like use them as sort of dolls in some way. But I want to, I mean, I want to sort of really want them to, to give them some kind of life and to sort of go, mm. go away and do some things and surprise me. Mm. 
um, for me that's a matter of respect. That's a matter of respecting the characters and respecting the actors and respecting um, in a way the audience because I don't want to make a movie about people I don't like because I don't really want to see movies about people where I feel that the director hasn't really liked the characters. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I think I see a lot of those films, especially sort of serious, arty kind of movies. Mm -hmm. I, th I think I actually feel more warmth and love in sort of simple comedies than in heavy, serious movies. And I think that's a problem, actually. Mm -hmm. I think there's a tendency in serious, this sort of serious art world sort of always be to go towards the cold mm. attitude. Mm. Do you think that there's a bias against more optimistic or warm films yeah. because they're seen as less complex for some yeah. reason? Yeah, and that's of course, that, that is of course the big challenge because it's very difficult to make something that is both complex and warm and optimistic and everything. And I'm not saying that I, I have achieved it, and I don't, I'm not saying that I, but I think I, that's sort of, today, that's my ideal, to mm. sort of achieve something that is very complex and at the same time very optimistic. Mm. Because it's, I think it's very, it's like cheating a little bit to make something complex and pessimistic, because that's sort of like, that's easy. Mm. Anyone can make a film like that. Mm. But sort of like make it complex and optimistic, that's difficult. Would you ever pursue a, a romantic comedy or something yeah. like that? Yeah, I think uh, there are a lot of genres that I would really like to sort of try. But I'm not sure if I would, I'm going to do it, but I think that there are, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I really feel that... I think there is a misunderstanding which I also fall for. I, I do this misunderstanding myself a lot. That sort of like if you feel that there is a that we, you live in a troubled time in a troubled world, that you sort of need that the need what that what you should do is sort of like talk about it in a troubled way. Mm. But there is also something about comforting or about sort of trying to show that there are there is there are small lights which doesn't necessarily have to be that sort of like everything is like a big spotlight. Mm. But there are also always there are always small lights. I think that's forgotten, mm. often forgotten. It also seems like there's an aspect of forgetfulness in the sense that it's a film about punk that was kind of declared dead by the time of 1982. Mm -hmm. But now we're watching a film about it now. Do you think that there's a way of kind of Reminding people that this kind, this this rebellion, optimistic rebellion, can still exist now. Yeah, and I think that I mean I I don't know about Canada or North America or I don't know about outside of Sweden, but I think I I, I hope that in Sweden at least, or maybe outside of Sweden too, it will meet an audience with young people in it, and I think it will be interesting to sort of see what the reactions are because I think there is a it's a, it's a movie. I mean. We're all individuals, so of course there are young people today who do the same thing, but there is something wonderful with these characters that they sort of like always question things and always sort of, they sort of interact very much in a, in a very physical way with mm. the world. When they find something on the street, they bring it home and they sort of like, and they go into hamburger places and ask for free food because they, are, they don't have any, they are hungry. And I think that kind of sort of direct interaction with the world is, sometimes today forgotten because we have computers mm. and we have sort of also fallen into some kind of cynicism where we feel that it's difficult to change things. And I think there is some kind of something that I like about these, the girls in the film that they are not very cynical. Mm. They sort of like, they really believe that it's possible. I mean, they, sometimes they're very, very naive. The two of them who are sort of the original punks, they, 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 they want to, this Christian girl to join their band and then they say that we have to stop her from being Christian. We have to sort of make her not believe in God anymore. And they, even though if that, even that, I mean, that's a really stupid and naive idea, but it's all still an idea that, you know, you can, you can change things. Hmm. We write music to, to sort of influence people and make them think about things. And I think that's, I think that's, at least in Sweden, that is something that is needed more. Hmm. And what did the actresses contribute to, to this? Because they would obviously be coming from a different perspective of mm -hmm. not having lived through this. 
Mm, no, they contributed a lot, of course. Mm. They brought, I mean, the, it, the film would have been very different with three other actors, so I think the actors always uh, uh, bring in a lot uh, of themselves and everything. And um, it's difficult to say exactly what and how much, mm. because, I mean, I would have to make it again with other actors to try that. Um, I mean, they are really smart and free-thinking persons, but they are also, of course, products of the time they live in. And I think that one of the things that we talked about that was sort of a little bit difficult for them to, not to understand, but to relate to, was the fact that, well, since the, it's an autobiographical uh, story in the, to begin with, I could sort of talk about how my wife, how Coco had felt when she was 13 years old. And mm. she said, for example, that she definitely didn't want to look cute or to look, you know, good looking for the boys or mm. something like that. And so she wanted to look tough and funny. And I think that's the sort of concept that is not really, I mean, even in today's alternative movements, mm. subculture movements, it's still sort of, girls should still look a little bit cute, and, mm. you know? So I think that was a strange thing for them. So when we talked about their clothes and their, hair and everything that was that was interesting for them I think. Mm. Thank you Lucas. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Because <laughs> it's